twenty-three. New Edinburgh Spaceport, Caledonia, Sky March, Federated Commonwealth, fourteen hundred fifty-one hours, thirteenth of April, thirty fifty-seven. The agromac had frozen in place. One leg raised clear of the ground, the other three locked and unmoving. Agricultural machinery had to be tough, but it was rarely built strong enough to stand up to combat. For several moments, McCall and Alex had stayed where they were, watching the relentless advance of two Legion Max across the spaceport, a Vindicator and a Griffin. Alex was pretty sure from the numbers and hull markings that the Vindy was Sergeant Kilroy's first company combat lance machine, but who was the Griffin? And just as he realized who that Max pilot must be, McCall grabbed his shoulder, pointing to the south. Punch out now! Alex saw the oncoming aerofighter just as a stuttering barrage of laser bursts bracketed the agromech. Shearing through one of the legs as cleanly as any vibroblade, the bulky internal combustion engine burst into flames and thick oily smoke. Flexing his knees, Alex fired his Nighthawk's suit jump jets. The cockpit filled with swirling smoke and superheated air, and then, jets howling, he was sailing across the tarmac just as a great Death Legion Corsair, its needle nose painted with a vivid shark's face, thundered low overhead, hurtling north. Where were those battle mechs? There, shifting his weight to the right, he adjusted his course slightly, then increased his speed. Launch. I've seen a hostile launch," Caitlin yelled over the intercom. She'd seen the agromech explode. Pieces of the thing were still raining down across the black ferrocrete pavement of the spaceport. At the last possible instant, though, something had streaked up out of the agricultural machine and veered straight toward her Griffin. It was moving too slowly to be a missile, though it could be some sort of remote control device. She pivoted her Griffin's upper torso right. Raising her right arm as she turned to acquire the target, the thing was coming too fast for her to dodge out of the way. But she might still knock it down with a burst of auto cannon or laser fire. Then she realized what she was seeing. Negative, negative on that launch. Don't fire. Even thirty meters away, the Nighthawk suit seemed to blur its own outline and was difficult to follow with the eye. It was moving much more slowly now, and Caitlin could make out the man's overall form and recognize the design of the suit. All units, she announced. I've got one of them. I've got one of them. It wasn't exactly a concise or informative report, but everyone in the unit would know what she was talking about. One of the men posted to Caledonia had just been spotted. The man shape slowed to a hover. The last bit of thrust from his jump, very nearly exhausted, nursing his dwindling thrust across those last few meters, he closed on Caitlin's griffin, then collided with her upper torso with a metallic clang. Caitlin found herself staring into her own face, reflected in the shiny visor of the Nighthawk's helmet. Then the visor slid up, and she was looking into Alex's clear blue eyes. Caitlin. He yelled. His voice picked up on her external mics. Caitlin, I know you must still be mad, but please don't shoot me. I've changed, really. I have. Grayson urged his victor forward. He was too far away to pick out details, but he'd seen the low, strafing run by the corsair, seen the explosion of the agromac that was now sending a greasy black ball into the afternoon sky over the starport. All units," a voice said over his headset. "This is Caitlin De Vries. I've got Alex here. He's safe." Something sagged deep within Grayson, and the victor very nearly faltered. Alex was safe. Somehow he kept his voice level, and his response to business. Caitlin, this is Colonel Carlyle. Any sign of Major McCall? Negative, Colonel. Alex says they were together. He thinks the major jumped the same time he did, but he didn't see for sure. Did you see anything? No, Colonel. 
I just saw Alex jump clear an instant before the junker exploded. Davis couldn't be dead. Not from friendly fire. No, it wasn't possible. All Legion Max, keep an eye out for Major McCall. He may be out on the ground somewhere, and he may be hurt. Advance the perimeter line and try to find him. Grayson had brought his victor around the terminal, passing through the spaceport perimeter fence, shredding steel mesh like so many threads. Now he urged the big mech ahead, angling toward the smoking ruin of the agromech. Overhead, two corsairs circled. God, Colonel, a woman's voice said, blasted by static. I'm sorry, I thought I had a fire order. Don't worry about it, Airshow. Just keep the real hostilities off our backs while we complete our search. Roger that. Our enemy Locust appears to be withdrawing. He may have been frightened off by your mech's deployment. Roger that. Frighten him some more, if you can do it without hitting any civilians. Roger, Command 1-1. One, one. And then Grayson saw him, a lone figure made fuzzy by the chameleon armor he wore. The figure was moving across the endless black flatness of the spaceport field, walking away from the smoking pyre of the agromech. Grayson edged his victor closer, until he towered two meters above the nighthawk-suited man. That had better be you inside that suit, McCall, he said, using his external voice circuits rather than the radio. They should have agreed on tactical frequencies before the mission, Grayson thought with some small disgust. Neither McCall nor Alex would have been able to radio the mechs directly, and with the jamming they'd been too far to get a clear signal through to the dropships. Aye, sire, the figure said, and he raised his visor. It is I, but I'm afraid my wee bairn here is a bit worse for wear. He turned around, and Grayson saw that the entire backpack unit, housing power supply and jump jets, had been mangled by the Corsair's laser beam. I got about three meters clear of the agromech, McCall continued, and suddenly this bloody thing was not working at all. I ended up heels overhead with the mech going up in flames about me. Just so you're working, Davis. I don't think I could manage without you. Welcome back to the Great Death. Four hours later, the Grey Death was in complete control of New Edinburgh, the spaceport, and the approaches to Mount Alba and the Citadel. Grayson returned to the Endeavour, and there, in the dropship's small conference room, he at last clasped the arm of Davis McCall and fiercely embraced his son. To say I'm glad to see the two of you would be pushing the art of understatement a bit far, he told them. Both men looked drawn and haggard, and McCall's arm was immobilized in a sling. What the hell happened to you, Davis? The wee bastards winged me arm, sir, McCall said, letting his bird drip the broad highland vowels and rolled R's. But it takes more than that to down-check the likes of me. Five days ago, I was shown a vid of someone in a nighthawk suit kneecapping a victor, then getting hit by laser fire while he was evading. Was that you? Aye, sire, it was, I'm ashamed to admit. I must be losing touch for the Sassanac to have their way with me like that. Grayson smiled. I thought I recognized your combat style, Major. Well, I'm glad you made it. I'm glad both of you made it. And Davis, I owe you an apology. I shouldn't have sent you here in the first place. Not the way things have worked out. Actually, they've worked out very well, Colonel. We got me brother out of the governor's vacation home, Alex and me. Thanks to that, I may be on speaking terms with at least some of my family now. Some of them, eh? Well, that's good news. Grayson turned to his son. Alex, you're looking... well. He couldn't quite put his finger on the difference, but there was one. His son seemed more confident, more self-assured than he had been in months. Alex grinned at him. Maybe I just got some priorities straight. The grin faded and he shook his head. There's some bad business going on around here, Dad. They wanted a great death to come here, 
and I think they mean to use us against the local population to keep them quiet and in line. More than that, Grayson said, noting his son's use of the word us. I received direct orders this afternoon to raise the city and turn our weapons against the people. I don't know what's going on here, but it looks like someone, like Volker or the governor, wanted the Legion implicated in a massacre. Like Sirius Five all over again, McCall said, rubbing his bearded chin with his good hand. Grayson nodded. Decades ago, a faction within House Marek had caused the Legion to be blacklisted and disgraced by cracking the dome of Tiantan on Sirius V, a poisonous hellhole of a world, in a plot to seize the Legion's handhold on Helm. Success all too often bred enemies, and when those enemies were both powerful and greedy, they would go to any lengths to secure what they wanted. Ya you know, sir, McCall added, I believe it goes a wee bit higher than we willy. Volker is a cheap thug who struck it big time, God knows why, and Wilmarf is insane. Is that a clinical diagnosis, Major? Near enough. The man kills for the fun of it, and enjoys power for its own sake. You could say that about a lot of mech warriors. The Major's right, Dad. Alex began describing what he and McCall had seen during their visit to the Citadel two weeks ago. He rules by sheer terror and arbitrary bloody-mindedness, Alex concluded. My impression was that Volker was providing any efficiency this government might have, and that he was acting on orders from someone else. Can you substantiate any of that? That he's acting on orders? Alex shook his head. No, sir, I can't. But I can give you ten thousand more eyewitnesses' accounts on what Wilmar's rule had been for the last two years. Dad, we have to help these people. Grayson sighed, folding his arms across his chest. I don't deny that. I do find myself, find the Legion, in a hellishly difficult spot, though. He cocked an eye at McCall. Major, I dislike being manipulated. I dislike seeing the Legion manipulated. That, more than anything else, is what turned me against Volker in the first place. It was clear to me that he wanted to use us for his own power politics, or those of his superior. But you were worse than he was. Sir? Dad? The two of you made promises to these people that were in direct opposition to the orders I received from Farcod. I find myself forced to choose between breaking those promises and ordering this unit to go rogue and attack our employer. Dad, we never meant... I know, I know. Grayson was suddenly very tired. He brought both hands to his face, rubbing his eyes. I would very much like to know what we're supposed to do now. McCall scowled. Sir, it seems to me that there is no argument here. I made the promises to the rebels. You can disavow my actions and court-martial me for exceeding my authority. Perhaps you'd best do that when this is over, no matter what else happens. But you cannot attack these people. They're fighting for their own, for their homes, their families, their security and their freedom. To back the likes of Volker and Wilmarf against them, well, sir, as much as it pains me to say it, you'd have to fight against me as well because I would be out there with them. That goes for me too, Dad, Alex said. His face was hard and worried. Throwing in with Wilmarf is just plain wrong. Alex, Davis, both of you know that it's impossible to run a mercenary regiment on good feelings, pretty words and chivalric sentiment. This is a business, not a crusade. Grayson paused a moment, watching the dismay on their faces. But, he stopped again, then shrugged, there are also things that have to be done, because not doing them would be to deny yourself and who you are. There will be no court-martial, Major. From what you've described, I would have made the same decision if it had been me here and not you. I would have made the same decision if Volker had ordered me to fire, even if I hadn't suspected that the two of you were still there somewhere, working with the resistance. But, 
Just for the future, mind you, you will both remember that intelligence operations are not conducted for the purpose of choosing sides or for volunteering time and resources. Aye, sire. Yes, sir. In particular, I dislike contingency contracts. I doubt that we're going to recover a tenth of what we expended on this trip, and by the time we're done, no one in the Federated Commonwealth will ever hire us again. He thought for a moment of Francis Collins, the Grey Death's disbursing officer, and Dobbs, the supply officer. Collins and Dobbs are going to have my hide on this one. A chime sounded. Come, Grayson called. Captain Allison Lang entered the conference room. Major Fry's executive officer and number two in his command lance, she was a trim, attractive, and highly competent woman who also served as 3rd Battalion's intelligence officer. Yes, Captain. Sorry for the interruption, Colonel, she said, but radar has just picked up high-altitude ionization trails in the stratosphere, coming down beyond the curve of the planet to the northwest. Descending? Yes, sir. Ops thinks they're dropships, inbound. You have a hard trajectory on them yet? They went down well beyond the horizon, Colonel, so we couldn't get a precise fix. Best guess, though, is the Sterling area. Just about 1,000 kilometers to the northwest, Colonel. Give or take a few, McCall said. And there's a spaceport there, almost as big as New Edinburgh. Folker told me that Wilmarth is bringing in another unit, Grayson said. The third Davion Guards. Aye. And they've already got mechs deployed here. Those two victors you saw in the video segment were third guard. Some of the locals went down and got that information for us. Damn it! How did they get to Caledonia without us seeing them? Alex wanted to know. That wouldn't be a problem, lad, McCall said. They could have come through the Nadir jump point. We wouldn't have seen them at all. Most likely they used the pirate point. Grayson said. The impression I had from Wilmarth was that they wouldn't be here for several days yet. But if they were loaded and ready to go at Hesperus, and if their navigational data were sharp enough to let them arrive at a pirate point within a day's flight or so of Caledon... Those ion trails, Lang said, are consistent with a pirate point approach. They re-entered over Caledonia's night side and closer to the equatorial plane than a flight coming down the hypotenuse from the Zenith or Nadir system points. Any chance we can get these people on our side? Alex asked. We'll give it a try, Grayson said, but don't hold your breath. If third guard mechs are already here and working for the government, it's because some sort of deal has already been struck. He cracked a wry smile. Just because we're willing to go chasing off on some damned fool crusade for justice, it doesn't mean everybody else on the planet is going to do the same. Well, it looks like the vacation is over, Colonel, Alison Lang said. The local militia isn't good for much more than target practice, but the third Davion is a top-notch outfit. Yes, it is. Captain, I want a complete report on the third guard. Command staff, assessments... Whatever you can find in Third Bat's database. Yes, sir. Immediately. Ten minutes, sir. Good enough. As Lang left the conference room, Grayson reached over to the tabletop console and keyed in a request. The wall screen switched on, showing a computer-enhanced view of the Citadel seen from the air. Well, gentlemen, he said, we will assume that the third guard is landing at Sterling, and that we're going to be its first target. First things first, however, this position has to be neutralized. Our communications people have confirmed that it's the source of the jamming we've been struggling with, and it's the key to controlling everything between the Alba Mountains and the Firth of Moray. Furthermore, I will not move north against the third guard with a strong point like this in my rear. Gentlemen, do either of you have any idea as to how we can take this place down with minimum losses to ourselves? They began discussing the tactical possibilities.